On April 5th, roughly two weeks ago, my 93-year-old mother, Genya Cohn Litwak, who survived the Holocaust, died of COVID in an assisted living facility in New Jersey. I found out she was dead from a text with the words, Baruch Dayan HaEmet, the Jewish blessing at the time of death. I was not prepared to lose her, just as I was not prepared to lose my father when he passed. Both my parents are Holocaust survivors. My mother grew up in Ludge, Poland, <clears throat> one of three children. Her father and all her uncles were in the textile business in Ludge. She was 12 when the Nazis invaded Poland. Her sister Branka, my aunt, was 14 and their brother, uh, Adam, was 20. The family decided to send Adam to Warsaw because it, they thought it would be safer for him. He died in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. My mother lived in an upper middle class neighborhood with people in her building who were primarily not Jewish. It was her, my grandmother's custom, her name was Ava. Um, I never met her, but was named for her to serve tea and food on uh, sterling silver trays with sterling silver flatware for her neighbors once a week. My mother remembered these afternoons from a different perspective. She thought that these women were my grandmother's friends, but it didn't take more than a few days following the Nazi invasion that these same women walked into my family's home and physically took the sterling silver tea set and all the sterling silver belonging to my family. My, never, my mother never forgot this story. The Nazis moved my mother's family out of their home and into the Ludge ghetto. They permitted my grandfather to go back into the house to get one item. He came out with an alarm clock. My mother till her death never understood why he would have taken an alarm clock. The Nazis called the Jews of Ludge ghetto out to the streets every day to examine them. They shot people who they believed to be sick. My grandmother, Ava, developed tuberculosis and was very pale. In an effort to keep the Nazis from shooting her, my mom and Aunt Branka would pinch her cheeks till they were almost bleeding so that they would be red before the Nazi inspection. She eventually did pass from tuberculosis. As there was a curfew in the ghetto, nobody was allowed to sit shiva with them. But in, despite the curfew, people risked their lives hugging the walls of the ghetto buildings to be at the shiva. Hala Milik risked her life every day. She was devastated when I called her two weeks ago to tell her that Genya had passed away. She said, we are all gone. There is almost no one left. The Ludge ghetto was eventually emptied, taking everybody still alive to Auschwitz. Genya and Branka were immediately separated once they arrived at Auschwitz from their father, Israel. When the Nazis first came into Ludge, they took the Jewish religious and business leaders, all men, away from their wives and children for three weeks. They beat them mercilessly. When my mother last saw her father, he had a jet black hair, jet black beard, and and uh, was very tall. When he came back and she saw him, she was shocked and very startled because his hair was uh, completely gray and he was permanently bent over in a hunchback position. When he stepped into Auschwitz and they saw his condition, they immediately sent him to the gas chamber. My mother and Branka till remember to this day or rather remember till their death, that, he, that they could hear him screaming their names, Branka, Genya, Branka, Genya, until he was gone. My mother and Branka were sent to another line where the women were. A German soldier signaled Branka to go to the right, which meant she would work instead of being sent to the gas chamber. My mother was and looked younger, so, the German soldier signaled her to go to the left, which meant she was going to the gas chamber. But in a split second, when he turned his head to the right, Branka grabbed my mother, pulled her behind her, and saved her life. Next, they were online to see Dr. Mengele. He kicked every woman in the stomach with a steel-toed boot. His intention 
was to abort any babies. My mother and Aunt Bronco were to work for the Nazis. Their heads were shaved. They wore a big yellow star on their gray clothes and wooden shoes. The Nazis, in an effort to confuse them, had them start work at midnight um, and finish work at noon. So at midnight, they would take a two hour uh, walk between several small towns till they got to a factory where they were placed on the top floor of that factory. The Nazis knew the allies wouldn't bomb the factory because there were Jewish people working on the top floor. My mother and Branka felt differently. They wanted the allies to bomb their building and every building where anybody was because they wanted to see the Nazis defeated and dead. So they worked a 12 hour day, walking home through several small towns at lunchtime. People from those small towns came outside and saw 2000 girls all with shaved heads, wooden shoes and yellow stars. And they saw them every day. It was a spectacle and something that gave them a lunchtime break. In the 1980s, I was watching TV with my mother and there was a magazine show on. And the program, a section of the program was about one of these small towns where my mother and 2000 girls walked through. The TV crew intentionally um, interviewed older people likely to have been alive or who were alive during the war. Each one claimed to have never seen or known a Jew. While I was sitting next to my mother and hearing these people say this, my mother literally lurched at the TV, screaming liar. I had never seen her do that before, liar. You saw me and you saw 2000 girls, you're a liar. When the Nazis knew that they were going to lose the war, they took all these girls and forced them on a death march. Those that managed to stay alive uh, were made it to Mauthausen where they were placed and later they were liberated by American soldiers. And my family's love for American soldiers never wavered. Now, after the war, Bronca and Genya tried to get to Israel, but they were turned back by the British. They ended up in the Jewish DP camp called Bindermichel, which was in Linz, Austria, the town where Hitler was born. My father, Zygmunt Litwak, grew up in Jajitze, a small town outside of Warsaw. He was 17 when the war started. He was in 12 labor and concentration camps. He kept escaping and the Nazis kept recapturing him. At one time, he was in a rail car that was open on the top and everybody in the rail car sitting next to him was Jewish and the two and the Nazis were sitting on two planks of wood staring down at them with guns. This uh, convoy was attacked by the allies and the two Nazis were killed and as soon as my father could jump out of this car, he would. But of course, as soon as he went into the woods, he kept getting recaptured. I was incarcerated at a woman's prison several years ago. Prior to my incarceration and for almost 45 years, I didn't attend Shabbat services. But once I got to prison, I wanted a siddur, which I did get. And I found myself every day saying, uh, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. I said it all day, every day, like a meditation. When I thought of why I was doing it, I saw immediately an image of my father davening and a memory of a story came back to me. So for most of my life, my family had dinner together every Shabbat. After dinner, I would, my parents would tell us stories about their families because we wanted to hear it. I wanted to know each family member, what they looked like, how tall they were. So until I went to college and for most of my life, Friday night was very special because we had Shabbat, but it was also special because I was learning in a positive way about people who were part of my family and just who I was not going to meet. So 
I thought I heard most of the stories by the time I went to college. But in 1988, 43 years after my parents were liberated and at least uh, you know, a decade after I had left home, um, I heard a new story and this new story impacted my life. I had bought um, an apartment with, I had bought an apartment for my parents and myself in Boca Raton. A lot of the survivors by the 1980s were doing well and they were uh, vacationing or getting second apartments in Boca. I knew my parents would never buy themselves an apartment, even if they had the money, because their priority would be to have it for my brother and I or their grandchildren. Um, so I bought the apartment and we went there that New Year's Eve weekend. So on New Year's Eve day, after they attended a party, I heard a story that would change and impact my faith in God forever. After the Germans came into Jejitse, it was illegal, my father's town, for a Jew to have a siddur, a talit, or a tefillin. You were shot if you were caught carrying these items. For some reason, my father decided to carry his velvet pouch containing these items with him to work. A Nazi on horseback stopped him and caught him with his prayer bag. He asked Jews that were standing around the area to come and watch what happens to a Jew who disobeys. He beat my father to within an inch of his life. After he left, a young Jewish doctor came to help my father and, and said to him, I have done all I can, the rest is up to God. And after everyone left, my father looked up and said, if you allow me to live, I will honor you every day through prayer. He survived and kept his promise to God. He davened every day his entire life. And as a young child, as a three-year-old child, three-year-old child, I would follow him as he went into a corner to put on his talit and to fill in. And he would know I was standing there and always smile at me. And when it came to the part where he was wrapping the leather around his arm, I would walk over, stick my arm out and ask him to tie our arms together so we could pray together. It's this memory of my father smiling at me while he was praying that stuck in my mind. It was his absolute love of Judaism, God, and prayer that was so clear to me. And when I thought, why am I wanting a prayer book? And I immediately saw that image from childhood, I knew why. So my parents went to a party with 200 survivors over this New Year's weekend. There were two rooms with 10 people at a table and the hostess walked over to my mother and introduced herself and uh, introduced herself to the table and said, my name is Mrs. Shindell, I'm your hostess. And he said, my husband, Dr. Shindell is in the other room. Um, a few minutes later, people started to cry and scream and everybody was wondering what was going on. My mother looked over and noticed my father was missing, but he was always missing because he wanted to be the first one to find out what was going on. So she wasn't surprised that he had gone into the other room. However, when she walked into the other room, she saw my father on his knees with his arms around the waist of this man who was clearly partially paralyzed. They were both crying and no one, including my mother knew why. The man was the Jewish doctor who some 45 years ago said to my father, I've done all I can. The rest is in God's hands. When my father heard the name Shindel, he suspected it might be him and went in to check. They knew each other immediately. They cried because they were both still alive. I know without a doubt that just as my father found deep faith out of tragedy, so did I. Of the 900,000 Jews who survived, roughly 250,000 were in one of the 57 Jewish displaced persons camps in Austria, Germany, 
and Italy. It was in Bindermichel where my mother and father met. My mother was gravely ill by the time she arrived at Bindermichel. Fearing her gallbladder would burst, the American soldiers who initially were going to take her to a German hospital thought better and took her to an American doctor. She was inches away from dying from a burst gallbladder. Branka had learned English when she was prior to the war. She was able to get a job working for the American Air Force while at Bindermichel. My mother was in horrible pain and needed some morphine. And Branka went to the black market to get it for her. But she needed someone to take it in because she knew the Americans would check her. She found Ziggy Litwak, one of the organizers of the DP camp. My father and others were creating a bulletin board. One of the things they did was creating a bulletin board for messages from families from different cities. For every city had a column and you put notes down if you, if you were alive to tell other people. And my father would travel from camp to camp to try to hook up families back together. Branka thought him perfect to take the morphine to my mother. He went into the hospital at 9 a.m. and as he tells it, immediately fell in love with my mother. She tells a different story. She said, everyone visited me for the first few days while I was in the hospital. There were plenty of handsome men, but your father stayed from 9 a.m. until they literally had to kick him out at 11 p.m. And she knew he would make the best husband and best friend and he was. Soon after she came out of the hospital, Ziggy moved in to, uh, with uh, Genya. Branka also lived there too. And he and my mother were together till his death, January 31st, 2002. The Jewish DP camps were filled with teenagers and young adults because Hitler kept this age group alive to be his workforce. Now without parents and money being stateless and homeless, they immediately, miraculously, just chose to start their life again. Within a few years, survivors married, had children. In spite of the fact that they had lost everyone and everything, they began to couple up and create a, create a city out of their displaced persons camps. My father and mother set a date to marry. My father had two sisters, and his parents. He knew that his younger sister, Edja, had died in Auschwitz, but had no idea whether his mother, Erna, father, Nathan, and sister Stella were alive. A few weeks before my parents were to wed, my father got a note from his, mother, from his mother's sister living in New York, telling him that his parents and sister had survived in the Russian labor camps of Siberia. My parents postponed their wedding. My father made arrangements for them to get to Bindermichel. And once there, my grandma Erna took over the kitchen, started cooking and baking with what little supplies they had for the wedding. I grew up with survivors, hundreds of them. Each was an aunt or an uncle and the kids, well, we were all cousins. My grandparents were the only ones their age to survive. So they became everyone's grandparents. The Jewish DP camps were a place for everyone to grow up and everyone to play. The American soldiers uh, sent Nazis in to clean Bindermichel every day. My father, mother, Branka, and some friends decided they wanted to do something to the Germans. So they organized a group of people to get on top of the largest building, which was only three stories, and to find the narrowest street because the Americans took the, uh, uh, the Nazis in and out with an, in an open cart. So my mother, my father and their friends took buckets of water. And as the truck carrying the Nazis passed through, they started pouring the water on top of the Nazis. They laughed, they felt great. The Americans of course, never brought the Nazis in to clean again. And as my father would later say, it was worth it. I grew up with a large extended family of survivors and their children. It was a glorious childhood because our parents were determined to live a full life. During the winter, we spent every weekend with survivors and their kids. And in the summers when they could afford it, we took over half of a bungalow colony. 
none of the Americans who lived on the other half of the bungalow colony had a clue which child belonged to which parent because we were like one big family. Since the family of origin was gone, it was re not replaced, but it was augmented by a chosen family. Until I left for college, my extended family of survivors were part of my life every day. I interviewed my mother's friend, Hala Millick, who still lives in Queens, for research I did on Jewish DP camps. During her interview, she told me that at the beginning of every party, she would say, let's not talk about the war tonight. And within 10 minutes, they would all be talking about the war. And as Hala says, they did this for 70 years. Solomon Metzger, Sigmund Metzger, Suzanne Metzger, Natan Metzger, Lori Metzger, Frederick Lisolat Metzger, Helene Claude Monique Metzger, Solomon Metzger, Gabrielle Poldi, Michael Metzner, Edmund Metzner, Ivan Metzget, Metzner, sorry, Gaston Metzger, Heinrich Metzger, Jacob Metzger, Joseph Metzger, Lazarus Metzger, Leopold Metzger. <laughs> 